Listen to your heart, follow your gut, use your head. Has anyone said these things to you? And if so, where were you? What was happening that compelled someone to give you this kind of advice? I came face to face with these three sentences while straddling a line between a life that wanted to begin and a life that wanted to end. And on this side, there was hope for more joy and satisfaction and success, but that came with a boatload of uncertainty and risk. And on this side, there was safety through conformity, misery, loneliness, bouts with shame, and I could trade that all in for a bountiful amount of treasure in an afterlife. <laughs> You're with me on that, right? <laughs> what would you do? Would you listen to a multitude of voices saying, stay the course, which means you must stifle the voice within? Or would you be willing to discover what it means to listen to your heart and follow your gut and use your head to walk through the uncertainty? The story took place over two decades ago, and I'll share the story. But first, let's talk about the navigational system that guided this cathartic experience. I call it combined wisdom. You may call it your intuition. But did you know that science and technology are now telling us that we can access the wisdom of our heart and the wisdom of our gut like we do the wisdom of our head, and not just for big decisions, for the everyday variety as well. So moving toward the story, it involves the proverbial closet. And while my closet doesn't look like your closet, perhaps, most of us would admit to having a closet. Some of us call it a pair of golden handcuffs, things that keep us tethered to those items we no longer desire. And I know this because I've worked with a space engineer who wanted to be an elementary school teacher. I'm currently working with a yoga instructor who wants to become a comedian and a professional clown. And these visceral decisions can take us to the edge, and they can put butterflies and knots in our tummy, aches and yearning in our heart. They can keep us tossing and turning sleeplessly, trying to wrap our head around, what should I do? And that's really the common ground, isn't it, between you and I? We want to know, how do I navigate uncertainty? How do I do what's best and make a choice that feels right? Well, I used three questions to make my decision. And the first question was, what does my heart truly want? And immediately there was a vice around my heart because fear often arises when we address our vulnerabilities. So I let that question settle, and it developed like a Polaroid snapshot into an image of a heart with electrical cords reaching out, looking for connection. One wanted to stay connected with my children. One was looking for true, honest, courageous friends. And then there was this big plug and cord, the 220, 240 kind you find behind your stove. <laughs> my heart was saying, Lynn, you want big, powerful connection with a significant other. The second question was, what path would my gut have me follow? And the image appeared of a door opening up and my feet walking through. And the third question was, in your mind's eye, Lynn, what can you imagine for your future? And again, there was fear and worry pinging in the back of my brain, saying these questions like, what about your reputation? What about the life you've built? So I let that question settle as well. <laughs> and it developed into the image of a tunnel. I was standing at the dark end, and at the other end, there was a light so bright it drowned out all the detail. And I remember thinking, if I go in that direction, maybe I don't have to worry about the detail. I took these three messages. I integrated them into a single line of truth, and I walked that line toward the light, and I let the old life die. Instantly, I lost family. Neighbors, my community, I lost status and respect. But I did not lose the connection with my three courageous children. <laughs> In 
In just a couple of months, I noticed my health had increased, my wealth was expanding, my sense of self and satisfaction was growing, and this list does continue to grow. And I could have said, glad that worked out. I could have chalked it up to coincidental wisdom, and you know the type. Listen to your heart, follow your gut, use your noggin. But I knew it wasn't coincidence. So I've spent two decades studying, researching, and certifying and bodies of knowledge concerned with things like multiple brain integration, neuroscience, and neurochemistry. And I'm going to share some of that science with you right now. Now note, <laughs> you may not see images like my Visual Thinking Center creates, but some of you will. Whatever happens, be willing to observe. Bring your awareness to this moment. And notice what you experience in your body when I say exclusion, withholding, judgment, and criticism. Now, notice what you experience in your body when you hear the words appreciation, celebration, discovery, and joining. What did you experience? Many people in the first group say, I felt like I needed to protect myself and I wanted to shut down, and some will even admit to not doing the exercise because they could sense what was going to happen. The second set usually opens people up, helps you feel more free, willing, and even curious. Words can bathe our brains in this way, can't they? They can leave us experiencing many things. They can give us oxytocin, like when we cuddle a bunny or a baby. They can give us cortisol, like when that pesky boss is asking, when will the report be finished? And when I say words, there are a couple of things we need to talk about about words. Because what you just experienced came from words, didn't it? That is the experience of neurochemistry. This is what Judith E. Glazer says about words. She says they are not things. They are the representations and symbols that we use to make sense of, to view, to process our perceptions. And then we share those with other people. Now, I've been talking about brains, haven't I? And when I use that word, I do indeed mean your head, heart, and gut brain. We now know there are complex neural networks in each. We know that they are labeled and classified as functional brains. And now we know they do respond to words. And why is that? Well, one of the jobs of a neural network is to listen and communicate. This is why people like Stephen Porges, the creator of the polyvagal theory, he coined a word called neuroception. Scientists and researchers have been inventing new words to help you and I match those words with the experiences we have in our physiology when we come in contact with one another through conversation and human dynamics. Now, let's get to the heart of it, pun intended, and let's look at how this happens with these slides from the HeartMath Institute. You are looking at a cardiac ganglion. It's composed of nerve cells. It's linked through synapses. This image that you can see, this is cardiac neurons, and they are responsible for sending messages across the heart's nervous system, that entire intrinsic nervous system, and up to the head brain. And the head brain understands these and often obeys. In the 1990s, Dr. J. Andrew Armour proclaimed that we have 40,000 sensory neurites in our heart and that it's doing brain-like stuff. But you and I know this. Listen to how we talk about our heart brain. It's not just a blood pump, is it? We say things like, my heart wants to be home with my family. Oh, in my heart of hearts, I know that's the right decision. And Marvin Oka and Grant Suzalu noticed these linguistic patterns, published work called Multiple Brain Integration, and they suggest that if we formulate questions around certain topics, we can access the wisdom of the heart brain. And these topics include things like compassion, connection, and relationship. 
Now, I see some of you nodding your head and getting this. <laughs> you know about the heart brain. And, but you're thinking, a gut brain? Well, this is your enteric or gut brain. It starts at the back of your throat and basically goes to your very own back door. You know where that is. In 1917, a German pharmacologist knew where that was too, and he took a piece of intestine. He isolated a little tube of a bowel away from the subject, and he blew into it, and it blew back. It mobilized on itself without any other help from a brain or a body. That would be like you and I picking up a trumpet and blowing into the mouthpiece and having it blow back. By the 1990s, Gershon had written a book called The Second Brain, A Scientific Basis for Gut Instinct. We know there are probably close to 500 million neurons in the gut brain or thereabouts, and we know there are 400 times more messages going from the gut up to the head than the inverse. And again, we kind of know that, don't we? Listen to how we talk about our gut brain, not just like it's plumbing. We say things like, I wish I was courageous like she is. I want to do what she's doing. We might say things like, oh, I had a bad feeling in my stomach last night. My gut said don't go, so I didn't. And again, Suzalu and Oka tell us, hey, we can access this gut brain if we formulate questions around topics such as self-preservation, mobilization, take action, don't take action, even courage. Now, I'm not suggesting, nor are these scientists and researchers suggesting, that the heart brain and the gut brain are as sophisticated as the head brain. Goodness, no. Susanna Herculano Housel, a Brazilian neuroscientist, recently told us we have 86 billion neurons in the head brain. And we can see the complexity if we go through Glaser's four brain model. This is your primitive brain responsible for detecting threat. This is your limbic brain, among other things, it stores a history of your emotional experiences. This is the neocortex, where we store knowledge and where we do bas basic thinking and reasoning and logic. And this is the prefrontal cortex. This is your executive brain. It's the highest evolved brain. It can make really good decisions in really difficult situations. And we can access it with questions such as, what would a breakthrough look like to you? What do you envision happening in your future? This brain is an excellent brain to have at the table during your times of uncertainty. You know, like when you are trying to find the light at the end of some tunnel. But be willing to pull up a chair for your other brains. I say be willing. Use your words. Ask questions. Access the insights of your head brain, the intimations of your heart brain, and the instincts of your gut brain. I say, have confidence. Come out to your own wisdom. Neuroscience says you can. Thank you. Thank you.